Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Dedicated to the Craft, a podcast brought to you by Ballast Point Brewing Company. I'm Jeff Lozano, your host, and we are turning 25 years old here at Ballast Point Brewing Company, so it's a big year for us. Um, one of the things that we're also talking about is art, complete art, inside and outside of the packaging, right? So if you know our brand and know our brand well, you know that Paul Elder's artwork is plastered all over boxes and cans and bottles, and that's cool, but there's also a lot of art going inside of that packaging. And that's a little bit more difficult to kind of wrap your mind around unless you home brewer, you know how beer works, about how brewing is art. So that's what this episode is all about today. We sat down with Aaron Justice, Chris Hotz, and Chris Takeuchi, the three amigos, the three musketeers down at our R&D facility in Little Italy, San Diego, about where it all starts before it gets into your refrigerator and where, where does it begin? And what kind of thought process goes into creating the next big beer, the next cool style? And it, this was a really interesting conversation because there's a lot of mind melding that happens between the three of these guys. They ha they each bring something different to the table. And when it comes to starting off with an idea, it's interesting to see how their mind kind of works and how the thought process is, uh, goes. I learned a lot today. I didn't even know how these guys do it. but. It's a really interesting conversation about where it all begins, and, and it's very much part of our innovation uh, here at Ballast Point. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Go to the fridge, grab yourself a cold one, crack it open, and uh, enjoy it. Cheers, you guys. All right. What's going on, fellas? <laughs> Jeff. <laughs> Hello again. Um, dude, really nice to have you guys back on. I, I feel like I haven't seen you guys in a long time because I haven't seen you guys in a long time, not even virtually. So um, I thought it was a great opportunity to start off the year, right? Happy New Year. What? How, how long does Happy New Year go on for? Is there a rule? Mid-January. I mean, today. Today? Is this I mean, the last day? Oh, I'm glad I caught it. The last, yeah, one, got, the last one got old in a hurry, so anything new can last as long as <laughs> <laughs> well, well, happy new year nonetheless. And what better way to kind of kick off this, uh, not kick it off because we had, we had Sierra Nevada on this last episode, but we're going to continue the new year festivities with new beers. And I kind of want to talk to you guys and let everybody have a little inside view of how the R&D facility works, how you guys as a unit, the three musketeers down in our little Italy location, kind of put your heads together and when we're when we're looking to scale up a beer and when we're looking to to launch a beer it all starts with you guys and i want to get everyone's heads wrapped around that but before we do let's crack open some beers and start drinking what do you guys got i guess i can start uh do it i've got burning beard this one right there oh nice Hopefully new damage. damage yeah az ipa and uh i'm enjoying it and it is as delivered uh that's pretty well, hazy. That is, that's, yeah, that's pretty hazy, dude. Yeah. Pots, what do you, you got? got? The aroma's great. Really? Uh, I'm just going to crack open here a virgin beer, uh, Carl's Bad Crush, Mosaic Pale Ale. Virgin, man, just killing the game, too. It's, it's a, it's a yeah. pale ale? Pale ale with uh, mosaic hops and uh, nice. Man, that is Good. really nice. Wow, great clarity on this one. Nice, dude. I dig it. Uh, Chris, what do you got, brother? Uh, I am drinking uh, Society's Agreeable Folk West Coast IPA. Um, and oh, nice. I, I was rude and I started before we started. So I'm already, uh, <laughs> I'm down to about 10 ounces. Um, it's delightful. It's, uh, it's what I want in a West Coast IPA. It's pale and dry and at the upper end of the alcohol. Like a, I like a seven and like that pushing the seven and a half going up a little bit above that. Um, nice. When you keep it dry and it's it's I'm I'm enjoying it. Dude, nice. Three great breweries make and uh, three new beers. And I'm gonna hit you guys with uh, a little Harland India Pale Whale. Excellent. <laughs> yeah, straight we'll off the, the packaging line, dude. Uh, <laughs> Mosaic Cryo Chinook and Simcoe six percent IPA. My boy Ryan over there at Harlan just killing the game, dude. They're making some good stuff too. So I'm going to pour that into a glass. And while I do that, let's get this going. Um, so a lot of people don't understand or really don't even ask where the beer starts. And it's a long process from when we start thinking about a beer 
and when it's actually out in the market. But take us through, and, and there's no really uh, any order or anything, but take us through a little bit of the thought process that goes into the, the, the start of a beer, any beer that, that you guys produce down there. Wow. Start beer. <laughs> yeah, usually, usually most of our best ideas come when we're uh, not busy, like, you know, cause you, when you're, when you're working, when you're doing, you know, if you're in the computer or you're in the cellar or you're on the brew house or something, you're kind of focused on what you're doing at that time. Uh, but it's really when we stop and and have a beer or two um, <laughs> when we you know you, you kind of get your brain moving a little bit and that's I think that's when we come up with our best ideas um, the ideas that are just something that we think oh that's a pretty cool idea and then we actually have the luxury and the resources to run with it um, that we usually end up coming with, up with something that's either really cool or sometimes it's a total failure, but the former happens more often than the latter. I, I would like to add that, um, you know, I want to make, I want to make it certain, or at least uh, let people know that uh, there is not a marketing team or sales team telling us what to brew. Right. Uh, it, it's not the cart le leading the horse and that we don't operate that way. Uh, it is simply like well, what the two Chris's uh, have said, which is that um, brew beer that, that we like to drink. So what do you what do you know of what you like to drink unless you drink beer? So I, I agree with them. Uh, inspiration comes while you drink other people's beer. And that's what we're doing today. I was just going to say that's the important part. It always comes when we're at other breweries. And it, it always does come after a few drinks. Right. And it, 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 it's usually not like, hey, we're going to go out and, and, and figure out what everyone's into, what everyone's brewing, what everyone's drinking. It's more like, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go and try something new. And if I like it, hey, can, is there something that we can do? It Can we, can we uh, try this or can we even put a spin on this? I love this beer, but it's lacking this for my particular palate. Let's try to brew it with that and, and fill that void personally. And and that's when you guys come up with with an idea, right? Is it is it is it really? What do you guys do more often? Do you guys come up with a recipe from, hey, let's brew this style and see how we can modify it or or brew uh, to style, or is it hey, this is a cool raw material, how can we how can we incorporate this into a new recipe? What what comes more often down there? Uh, I would say I would say that. We, I don't know that I would that I would say it's necessarily either of those. I think we kind of operate in a in a cloud that's in the middle of all of that, um, where, you know, when we're when we're out, well, not out because you know COVID, but when we're <laughs> when we're having a discussion that that ultimately kind of turns creative because that's just what we end up doing. Like we'll have a beer over something that's you know that's work oriented, and then we kind of run off and you know run off the rails a little bit. Um, I don't know that we, that I can recall in my memory that we've gone to drink other people's beer and have had something there where we're like, oh, let's, let's replicate this or like, let's figure out how to put our own twist on this style. It's more, um, trying to find something that exists in the spaces between styles a lot of times. Um, and that is like, what can we do that's, that's kind of unique and interesting and something that we haven't done before. Um, at least that's my, that's kind of my perspective is that we'll, and, and even, even with an existing style, like, I mean, we're constantly playing with hoppy beers is what can we do that, uh, that's new that hits our, that hits our palate at least because as Aaron said, we're trying to brew stuff that we want to drink. Um, I don't, I don't think that we're necessarily gaining inspiration from the beer that we're actually drinking when we're drinking the beer. It's more just that we're sitting and we're not thinking about work. Like we're out, <laughs> right. we're out of our, our, our work environment and then your brain can just start to wander around a little bit. Uh, and it's more figuring out when all three of our brains are wandering, where do they kind of vaguely overlap? That's, that's yeah. Kind of yeah. And you guys have been working together for a long time. Um, how long, how long has it been that the three of you have been a unit? Um, and 
it doesn't necessarily have to start when Aaron actually went down there, right? Because Aaron, you've had a lot of interaction with them fr from from any any position that you've had in the in the in the building. I mean, in the in the company. But how long have you guys been together, kind of mind melding? I mean, I mean, I've I've been keen. We're in the same building. Yeah, it's uh, that's a good point. Uh, I mean, I I actually have been at Little League for almost almost three years. Come April, but. Yeah, gosh, we've known each other for for a long time. I mean, all all three of us have worked at Scripps. All four of us have worked at Scripps Ranch. Uh, so it's it's been a, it's been a while. We know each other, uh, which is great. Uh, and each one of us have our strengths and and weaknesses. Uh, remember that I I my sensory is very weak on butyric acid, which smells apparently like baby vomit. <laughs> I can't detect that. Uh, which it's good to have other two people there to uh, to say, yeah, this is pretty rancid. Uh, but yeah, we, we we've been working together for for quite some time, and and uh, you know, uh, it, going back to even just the, the the creative process, you know, it, if, if you look at like uh, Chef's Table, I don't know if you've watched that on Netflix. Oh hell yeah, or not. love that. Very show. inspiring. And uh, a lot of these chefs, before they really start to branch out into like a, a creative s sphere, uh, they, they learn to perfect their craft. They know how to make traditional dishes really well. And once they do that, uh, then they can really know how to take these ingredients and get creative with them. And you know, to, to both the, the Chris's uh, credit, uh, they they have mastered their craft, and they're really good at what they do. And if you say, "Hey, brew traditional brown ale," uh, they can do that. And you have to be able to do that. You have to be able to brew traditional beer first, and do it really well. And once you get beyond that, you can um, you can say, well, gosh, you know, it'd be really cool if we took this hop, which traditionally is in that beer, and put it into this beer. So uh, mm -hmm. we, we've all kind of been now, uh, you know, the, the craft brewing industry uh, is still remarkably young, relatively speaking. But, uh, you know, we've been here long enough that uh, I feel pretty comfortable with what we're doing. <laughs> yeah, no, dude, I think everybody is very comfortable with what you guys are doing. And I, I know uh, Chris T kind of alluded to it in the beginning, but you guys don't, you guys have winners and then you guys have not so winners, but even those not so winners, they, there's something that you guys learn from it. And I, I've never had anything that's not palatable. So I don't know what, I don't know, uh, second place, that's what we'll call it. But a lot has to do with that synergy that you guys have down there because, um, you guys have a little system, whether you whether you know it or not, it is a system, and you guys all have your strengths and weaknesses. All right, man. Hey, okay, so you're back with us, Christopher Hotz. You finally got some signal, had to switch over to your phone, but it's all good, baby. What we were trying to get at um, before you got cut off a little bit was, tell us about your strengths. Aaron was talking about how you guys as a team, you all have your strengths and you bring something unique to the table. What do you think uh, you bring to the table that makes makes Chris Hotz the man. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with that. We all have uh, our, our strengths and weaknesses. And, and what's cool about our team is, is they're all different. Um, one of the things that I like to do is, is make beers that are too style. Uh, I'm a, I, I came from a homebrew background and then got into beer judging. So I've taken all the BJCP exams. And part of that is memorizing beer styles uh, memorizing, you know, what makes a certain style, uh, that style, whether it's the color of the beer or the IBUs or, or whatnot. Um, and so one of the things I like to do, I think because I've, I've gone through that process is, is make beers, uh, that are too style, uh, and kind of try to perfect them so that, uh, if I make a Munichellis or brown ale or, or whatever the style is, uh, I, I, I kind of try to make that style or that beer the best best it can be um, because you know go around to different breweries and, and try Mina Kellis at all of them and they, they all kind of taste a little different and, and as a beer judge it's really cool to sit down with you know 20 
uh, beers in front of you all from the same style and see how different they are. Um, and, and so as I judge, I, I kind of like to, I mean, part of judging is nitpicking. Uh, so I like to nitpick those beers and then, you know, also try to figure out why is that good and how can I replicate that? You're, you're the, the brewing angle, like you're a BJCP certified judge, but you're also a brewer for Ballast Point. And I know that being a judge has its uh, benefits in to your job, which is brewing. But how does it go the opposite way? Like you being a brewer, does it help you be a little bit more sympathetic to to uh, when you're judging beers? Does it make you a lot more nitpicky? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, gentle wall. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I don't know if it makes you more nitpicky because in a sense, you also understand how hard it is. Uh, so in, in many respects, it, it makes you kind of sympathetic to the brewers. Um, but, but what it does contribute is the fact that, you know, part of the R and D facility here, uh, we've used, you know, all the base, base malts, or we, we try to use as many base malts as we can from different maltsters. Uh, we try to experiment with all the different specialty malts. And so that's helped me as a judge because I can sit there and pick out different aroma and flavor compounds and, and say, you know, oh, that's there because of, of probably this mold. Um, and I know that mold probably, you know, a, a classic mold to use in that style. Uh, so it makes sense they would use it. But a lot of people go, oh, it has this nutty or almond character. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's probably melanonin. Um, so I think that that helps a lot. Yeah, so just you got a little muffled there, and I think it kind of the sound went in. But I think if you listen closely enough, uh, you can make it out. But what you were really saying was that those particular specialty malts, not even specialty, but like very distinguished malts, you're able to pick them up um, a little bit better than somebody who doesn't have a brewing background and who doesn't ha hasn't experimented particularly with that particular malt. You kind of have the one up on that, so that's that helps, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, I think, why not? I think it definitely United. helps. It, it's not. It's not negative. Um, Chris and I know Chris T. I, I, I know that you um, you have like this almost like other side of the spectrum approach, right? Yeah, and I, you know it's funny because I, I think this is why one of the big reasons why our team works really well together is that uh, I think Hots and I have very different approaches. So uh, I tend to think of beer more. Uh, at least right at the outset of binary, it's like, it's like, it's good or it's not, uh, or, which for your own palate, you know, it's, do you enjoy drinking it or do you not? And if you don't, um, I mean, you can dive in and nitpick if you want to, or you can just pour it down the drain and move on with your life. Uh, <laughs> and if you do like it, you go buy it again. I mean, it's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty straightforward thing. Uh, I, I will nitpick a beer when it's called for, but it's not my first instinct. Um, and I think that leads into uh, kind of how we operate a little differently from recipe formulation and, and just kind of how we think about um, our, our, our how we how we approach the creative process a little differently. Where, yeah, I think Chris uh, tends to uh, like going deeply into into specific beer styles, and I I actually don't. Um, I mean, I can do that. Um, and, and, Feel like i'm fully capable of writing a recipe for any given existing style but i really like uh finding the little gray areas um where you know you take a style and you just you just modify it to something that doesn't really exist as a style um and i think there's a lot of cool a lot of cool beers that you can make that are really awesome that are not going to show up in a style guideline um and it makes it challenging because one of the things that we try to do uh, down here is is we you know kind of go after um, uh, awards. Um, mm -hmm. And if you don't if you make a beer that's not the style, it's never going to win an award. But that doesn't mean it's not an awesome beer. Um, and with the amount of raw materials that we get to play with down here, you know, as Aaron said, you can take a hop that's in one style and you put it in something that doesn't really make sense stylistically, but it works. Um, and I think both, both of us, um, we are, uh, solid enough in our foundations, like the rudiments of working in a brewery or at least in our brewery, uh, where 
you know, we're not even really thinking about um, the the nitty gritty of working in a cellar or on a brew house because it's just sort of automatic at this point because uh, we've both been here for a really long time. Um, and so, you know, all of the stuff that, that comes along with working in a brewery, doing tank cleans and filtration and, and uh, all of the cellar work, uh, it's not even really a consideration, which allows us then to use uh, that time and those that kind of thought on on the more creative end, uh, because we're not having to, you know, use brain cycles on on accomplishing things in the cellar. Um, yeah, that, that's a good point, right? That's a good point. Once you kind of step into big production brewing and your whole shift might just be cleaning, although that's one of the most important facets of how we operate or, and how to get, you know, a clean and a clean environment to make world-class beer, it, it does interrupt that. It does interrupt that time that you could have on the brew house, tasting raw materials and doing some of the experiments that you guys do down there. And I know Aaron, you, when you became brewing manager at Scripps Ranch, when, when, when we were down at Scripps, one of the biggest kind of shifts that I saw as a, as, as a shift brewer was your incorporation of raw materials into our everyday work week, right? You were able to bring in new malts, make wart teas, and you did a really good job of, 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 basically exposing us to these different malts. Here's a malt, here are different maltsters. Let's pick out the, their intricacies. And I know that you guys still do a lot of that, even more of that uh, down at Little Italy. Talk, talk to us a little bit about how that is uh, kind of set up and how it helps. You do, you have to break it completely down to just raw materials. Uh, the raw materials, when we say that, obviously for some people that uh, may be kind of new to, to, to brewing, uh, we're just talking about hops, uh, which are flour, barley, which is uh, a grass, and uh, yeast, which is a which is a fungus, uh, which ferments uh, this this sugar concoction that we make uh, on the brew house. Uh, and yes, the, the the thing is, know your ingredients. The best chefs to go back to cooking. I, I keep using this as an analogy, but. Uh, there's a lot of truth to this. The, the the best chefs say you don't need to throw all these ingredients in to make a to make a great dish, right? But uh, and the same thing goes with beer. Use top notch ingredients and know how to use them to make a good beer. So a lot of times I'll see recipes, and I'm guilty of this. Uh, being a home brewer, I wanted to throw in 13 yeah. malts. <laughs> uh, in, into into a beer and oh yeah well this this one brings this and this one brings this and uh, th that's that's the way to do it and and then I realize now I I, I rarely use more than three three malts or two hops uh, just as long as you know how to use it and you use it right so it goes back to just kind of understanding those raw materials so we pull all those malts in from around the world all those hops in from around the world and uh, slowly make teas out of all of them, do a blind taste test and come up with a flavor profile for all of them, choose our favorite ones. And we do this, uh, we try to do it every, it's very time consuming, but we do it every, I would say about two to three years because uh, raw materials change over time and we need to stay on top of that. So it's very methodical. Uh, it's very scientific to get the data so that we then can have a palette to be creative off of. So then you can say, well, gosh, I, I kind of want this flavor. I want this aroma and this is how I can do it. So it is, if you don't understand the very basics of raw materials, uh, then you're, you're in the dark. Uh, let's talk about even just yeast. Yeast are organisms. They, they eat the food that we give them. And depending on uh, what yeast it is and what food you feed it depends on what flavor it's going to make. And so at any given time every year, uh, I, I remember uh, not COVID year, so not 2020, but 2019, we brewed 136 unique recipes. And very few breweries get to do that. 
uh, we, we have the opportunity to, to, to brew whatever we want, uh, whenever we want. And uh, that allows us a lot of freedom. So we, we take all that and we try to compile it into something that's tangible and then we can head in a certain direction uh, with a certain flavor right. or a certain idea. Uh, so a lot of it's methodical and a lot of it does involve uh, a decent amount of uh, creativity. And uh, that that's one of the reasons why I got into brewing to begin with was because it's so scientific, but it is also so right-brained or so creative. Yeah, yeah. And it allows you to do a little bit of both. And, and it's, it allows, uh, and discipline. You have to have uh, discipline. You have to clean meticulously. Uh, so, and I realized, uh, you know, when I was doing television years ago that uh, I that, that wasn't for me. And I realized that brewing was perfect for me. So, uh, I mean, I'm getting so many di different tangents, but. Dude, don't worry uh, about it. They all make sense. They it's all, all about sense. raw materials, man. If you don't know your raw materials and if you're not using quality raw materials, you're, you're not going to make good beer. You kind of brought two of the distinct kind of worlds of brewing together in that flow that you just did, which is the scientific data driven to a lot of people, boring and mundane aspect of brewing and the more artistic kind of creative flow. Both are super engaging and they both have an art, right? But if we're talking about brewing and we want to talk about the art, the, the artisan kind of appeal, right? The, the craftsman appeal. I think Aaron, like what you were talking about cooking and, and, and dishes, that's a, that's a great analogy. And you keep returning to it for a good reason. It's kind of like Mac and cheese, like craft makes Mac and cheese, puts it in a box, add water and go. So they kind of get something that's beautiful and that requires a lot of thought and detail to perfect. And they kind of murk the, murk the waters a little bit and kind of say, Oh, well, it's easy. Anybody can do it. So beer is susceptible to that too, right? With these, uh, with big brewing and all that stuff. And it, it, they can come out and say, it's easy to make. All you got to do is mix this, mix and mix that. What's so hard? Just pay attention to the temperature. But what you guys are doing down in little Italy is you're, you're retaining that, uh, that degree of, kind of artistry with a strong foundation of, of, of knowledge, science, and the physiology of it. And I think that that's important to bring up, and I'm glad that you did. When you guys kind of uh, get together and say, hey, we're going to brew a beer, do you guys think about, um, can, do you guys think about the artistry about it too? Like, how are we going to paint with these colors? <laughs> Hots, go ahead. <laughs> I can I can answer that. I mean, Hots is actually Hots. Hots, is, Hots might be a perfect guy to ask because you're so um, you know you, you you love styles and traditional styles for what they are. What takes it? What takes you to that place of where Chris T kind of lives and said, "Hey, how do we mess with this and make it different?" Uh, for, I don't know. For me, it's it's you know how do you how do you take a, a an idea and uh, make it with as, as simple as possible. So, you know, Aaron kind of talked about, you know, as home brewers and, and, and I did this too, is, is using a, a ton of different kinds of malts. Uh, for me, it's just, you know, how do I, what are the flavors I'm looking for and how can I get that with as little amount of ingredients as possible? Uh, because I think that lets, lets the malt shine the best or the hop shine the best. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, the, the art part also kind of comes into like how you guys dance together, right? Like as a unit, you guys have, have had to learn when this guy, you know, zigs and you zag, whatever, you know, like you guys are, are learning how to do this dance together to all come out at the end of the, of the meat grinder as this awesome beer that you guys are equally proud of, that you guys are all proud of no matter which direction it went. When you guys when you guys sit down and you guys wrap your brain around what's going to be the next beer that we're going to brew, um, is it is it oriented now that you work now that we're you know we're all ballast point and we have a portfolio, but it's okay to brew what we already have, but it's also okay to brew what we don't already have and somewhere in the middle. Do you guys lean on on as far as innovation is concerned? 
do you guys lean on on kind of thinking outside the six pack a lot? I, I would say it's both. Like, I mean, I, I think, I mean, COVID probably kind of amplified this a little bit, but, you know, uh, we have talked about, you know, what if hypothetically this was a standalone brew pub down here in Little Italy? Um, right, right. All of our beer was feeding the taps. Um, I, I want to make beer that people want to have multiple pints of. So I'm not thinking outside the six pack. Like I, I want to make like, you know, we'll do, we'll do very, very creative stuff. And, you know, we always have uh, the cost of making the beer in mind. We know that there's things that we make that uh, have no, there's no scale up. These are just expensive things. We can make them at our scale because the actual total cost is lower because we're making such a small volume of it. Anything that's got vanilla beans in it like that. I mean, it's, 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 that's really like intensely vanilla heavy. Uh, don't it, don't forget the saffron but, beer. Yeah, saffron which probably the most yeah. expensive beer. I mean, that, yeah. that beer was uh, had a yellow tinge to it, mm -hmm. it was because cool. of the insane amount of saffron that was in it. So okay. uh, what? I don't remember that one. Which one was that one? <laughs> yeah, Vienna Lager. Yeah, was, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah so there was a guy was who sure. who um, uh, had a saffron company and reach out to us and, and ask if we could use it. And, and we made a Vienna lager and, and that, that beer was awesome. It was cool. Uh, and, and I think I, I sell up a little bottle of, of saffron from that. <laughs> Dude, I don't remember that one, but it sounds awesome. You guys use that much saffron? A, a lot. It was a lot. A lot. And yeah. realize saffron is like hand picked. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a little, I don't know what you call it. It's a little part it's in the flower. middle of the flower. It's um, a flower. Yeah, and and wow, yeah, we use that a lot. That sounds awesome. That yeah. sounds awesome, and that's kind of what you guys do too, right? Where you guys are able to toy around with stuff, even if it's not, let's say, cost efficient in terms of the grander scale. It's it's awesome to understand how these particular flavor components are going to work with each other, so that it can further influence maybe a recipe downstream. And it, what you guys are a part of is research and development, right? And the research is there. You guys have talked a lot about the research and the development aspect is something that you guys do a lot of too. You guys rebrew a lot of our flagship OG recipes. And uh, what is it that you guys are looking for? Like if you take something like Piper down and you rebrew it down in, in at Little Italy, what, 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 why do you guys rebrew something that we already have in there? And, and, and what does that mean? I think, I think you, at the very least, you can try trial a new ingredient that we know that we like and uh, throw that into the whole recipe and just see if it uh, produces the results that we wanted. Uh, but we also sometimes just, we just have fun. Uh, I mean, this this latest version of Piper Down that we, we have in a tank, we're going to put uh, Peking peppers in it simply because we can call it Peking Pepper Piper Down. That's it. <laughs> the alliteration is beautiful. It is. So sometimes uh, a lot of it's just us having fun. If you can't have fun, what's the point? Uh, so yeah, what, when, once once you can kind of have this carefree attitude of, okay, let's, the sky's the limit. What do you want to brew? And uh, you don't have to explain it. It doesn't have to have this, you know, grandiose idea right sometimes it's just to do it because just because we we wanted to make i don't even have we, have we decided to do this yet have we made a corn wine yet we want to make multi-corn is a thing corn wine, yeah you <laughs> yeah. want to know how our process is <laughs> this is exactly corn. like we've had enough alcohol now that aaron just says something like that and we go yeah yeah, that, we can that do that. That sounds awesome. Let's yeah. do that. <laughs> it's it's yeah. like it's like bar behind uh what back of the napkin bar mm -hmm. innovation. And that's it, it it really does work that way. And I, I think everybody listening, if they love beer, they've had that some sort of light bulb go off, even if it's kind of flickering a little bit. Um, but they've had that kind of epiphany moment over a couple of beers and go like, you know what? Yes, that's amazing. Some of them you wake up the next day, go like, what the hell were we talking about? And then some of them you go, dude, let's, let's make that, let's make that a thing. That's that. Whatever you said right now about corn, Aaron, that's that. 
That's what I'm that, talking about. We got to get to the corner. By the way, the, the, the color of my beer has changed because this is a, a, a very small uh, pet project that we do at Little Italy, which is uh, uh, not necessarily wild fermentation. It's mixed culture fermentation. Uh, this is a, uh, a beer that we threw into a barrel and we inoculated it with a bunch of uh, bacteria and wild yeast and uh, then threw in a lot of uh, Zinvendil grapes from Paso Robles. Uh, it's, it looks like a wine and it smells a little bit like a wine, uh, but it's very uh, beery as well. Uh, this beer we, we just made, we put it into kegs. I think we put it in kegs, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still yeah. sitting in the bright yeah. tank. Yeah. yeah, so, uh, but but it's going to be coming out uh, very, very soon. So we, we do sours as well. So we, we do, we try to do everything. Yeah. Uh, just so we can understand uh, how do you make cider? Well, we homebrew cider. How do you make seltzer? Even though we're not really fans of seltzers, but uh, I want to know how to make seltzer. Uh, so, uh, again, it just goes back to, at times, being whimsical and having fun. Uh, this this beer, though, is very stellar. It, it's not overly tart. It's really funky, uh, but I can drink a pint of it. So that's a good sign. Whenever you have a beer and you go, oh, yeah, I'll just have four ounces of that, that's not a good sign. Right. You want something that it's, we call it drinkability, right? Not, yeah. You have to kind of catch yourself and realize what you're doing. That's what makes you stop. You go, whoa, whoa, whoa I shouldn't do another pint. Not, hey, man, I can't do another pint. Now, with um, that said, we made a variant of Victory at Sea that we put Carolina Reapers in uh, that we called Repercussive. And I will say that I, I will happily have four ounces of that because – not only does it give you an an endorphin rush from from the peppers, you immediately kind of get that warming from the alcohol as well, Ooh, and, nice and it's cozy. one of the it's one of the best feelings ever. So you have four we, ounces of that, and yeah, I, that I'm in good. heaven. Yeah, so if you think about it from that, it's just just a couple ingredients again, and you throw it in there and and see how it interacts. So I, I guess I don't want to say that I have to have a pint of that. But, you know, at home I drink a pint of it. Well, it, it also same. sounds like you guys not only look through the lens of what might work and what might not work, but you guys also look through the lens of drinking for well-being. I mean, I'm not saying it's curing anything. I'm just saying, like like you said right now, a rough of endorphins. Shit, man, I want a rush of endorphins, you know? I want I – want, uh, what you just described with that little uh, snippet of information for, of that particular victory at sea makes me want to drink four ounces of that. And I think that that also comes into play when you guys are thinking about um, toying with ingredients and toying with, with different recipes. You guys go, how is this really going to make you feel? Are we throwing it in because we think it's cool? Because, you know, that that could be a uh, – that's, that's a merited approach too. Or, hey, how about we do it this way because – the, the chili is really going to give you a punch and then it's going to give you this kick of endorphins. You're going to get rosy. This is, I, you guys look at it from, from a, a bunch of different vantage points. And I think that that's what makes our R and D facility, uh, such a, such a powerhouse of great ideas and great beers. I mean, yeah, I, I would say like, I, you know, kind of, it, it's interesting because it kind of tacks on to what Aaron said before about how, you know, any any of these things that we're doing is is we can we can be creative, um, pretty un, uninhibitedly. Is that a word? Um, you just made it one. Uh, inhibitedly. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, because we have our rudiments down, like we we are we're both very uh, very good in the cellar. We're not really like we have we have all of our ingredients. We have our raw materials. We understand them really well, um, and we know how to use them and execute on an idea. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, like I said, I don't, before, I don't know that we necessarily dig really deep into the, into the analysis of how do these two things go together? Or mm -hmm. Like, what we, I mean, we're trying to achieve something. There's a purpose to it, but, um, that purpose may be kind of whimsical, like picking pepper piper down. Um, you know, with the, we, we know if we're going to make a chili beer, we can make a really killer chili, chili beer because we know how to handle the chilies. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, any any raw material that's outside of your standard brewing uh, brewing ingredients, uh, or even within the brewing ingredients, we know we know how to handle them, um, and that's just just out of familiarity um, because we've been able to play with all of these raw materials so much. Um, there isn't really uh, uh, you know any, anything we get if it's if it's a fruit or a, a spice or an herb or or anything we we kind of have a handle on at least for our system how are we going to deal with this brand new raw material um, and how do we get the flavor to come through um, outside of uh, outside of material like there's there's just certain things that kind of are hard to translate uh, we've we've run into problems with pineapple. Um, like we have a hard time finding a really good pineapple project, a pineapple product that works for us. Uh -huh. um, but we're constantly like, okay, well, let's let's keep let's keep trying that. Um, but um, again, going back, it's all it's all grounded in fear, familiarity with our methods, um, and knowing that they work, and knowing that we can play around a little bit because all of our beers on draft. We're not worried about putting stuff in cans and bottles. Yeah, we're not worried about you know. Uh, we put lactose in something. We're not worried about what the can's going to do 12 months down the road if somebody leaves it in their trunk all, all, all year. Um, but that gives us that gives us more room to play because we are confident in our command of the raw materials. Yeah, sense. yeah, for sure, 100. percent And <laughs> and if anybody's just listening to this, I apologize. But if you're watching it on on YouTube or whatever, uh, where Chris Hotz is is broadcasting from, you can actually see their play place right there. I don't know if you can move it, but look at that, man. I mean, you guys are, I see some barrels. You guys have your, uh, your, your brew house. And then how many fermenters and how many bright tanks are we dealing with there? Uh, we have 10 fermenters, three bright tanks. And then look at that. Well, you can see we the latest have... collaboration collaboration that we're doing with those barrels, those whiskey barrels, it's a local yeah. distillery. We we pulled uh, whiskey barrels and we put uh, our ale nog in there. Uh, the reason being COVID. COVID. So uh, we, we had all this ale nog that we wanted to release in December and we decided, uh, what, what the hell, we're going to throw it in barrels and we're going to release it next year as a super boozy, wonderful... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> eggnog inspired uh, ale, dude. That and sounds insane. Ale nog. So oh, that that is aging. That's a thing. That's totally happening. <laughs> Get ready for that. Uh, the barrels are coming from a Henneberry uh, distillery in San Diego. They're up in this uh, uh, awesome distillery. They make awesome whiskey. Oh, nice. uh, and we out, we picked up these barrels. They just emptied them. Uh, they were totally filled with with. You know, I mean, it was it was a wet whiskey barrel, uh, and, and we filled these with that with that ale nog beer. Dude, that is so cool to see, man, and I and it's it, it's so cool to hear what what's what's happening because one of the things that I want to talk about too before we run out of too much time, it's you, you know we're coming up on our our 25th anniversary here at Ballast Point, guys. This is the 25th anniversary year, so cheers to that, Chris. Quick, go grab your beer. Cheers, cheers to that. <laughs> I'm, I'm empty. I gotta go get a beer. Oh, how dare you? How dare you? All right, we'll, we'll have we to. We'll have to wait. I'll, 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 step, I'll step on it. <laughs> but but one of the things um, leading up to the 25th anniversary that I think is kind of cool to talk about is all right. We we've talked a little bit in the past uh, about where we've been as far as our R and D facility is concerned. And right now, you guys just gave us a bunch of awesome information about where we are. But the three of you guys have 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 you know talked about where you guys want to go and where you guys want to be. And like right now, we just saw some barrels full of eggnog. That's where you, that's where we want to go. That's where we're going, right? What, what future innovations are in store from little Italy's R and D facility? Do you, what, what kind of cool things are you guys kind of thinking about? Even if it's a brainstorm, it's not going to happen. I just want to give people an idea of the art, the, 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 the the brewer's vantage point when it comes to, okay, where do we want to go? Because what you guys are doing down there, what we're all doing here is is artsy. It's 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 an art. And in order to really kind of wrap it around that brewing is an art and there's not just a bunch of people in marketing and sales and all this stuff and, and outside consumer feedback and stuff kind of dictating where we're going, this is where 
you guys really kind of have to sit at the round table and say, this is what we, this is where we want to go. And this is what we want to do. I think a, a big part of that is um, our, our raw materials are constantly evolving. So, um, and we get to use new raw materials all the time. So what we can do with those raw materials and our own approach to them has to evolve with it. So, you know, the, the India pale ale has, has evolved in the last, I mean, every, every year there's something new in the India pale, India pale ale category. Right. Um, and all of our hop vendors are constantly bringing out new hops, bringing new hops to market. Um, we did an experimental hop uh, sensory session before, before the podcast here. We're constantly um, being, we have the luxury of using a bunch of new raw materials um, and then figuring out what to do with them once they actually become commercially viable. Um, so what we're making can change um, and that gives us just a breeding ground for innovation to begin with is because our raw materials are changing. Right, right. That's a good point. Yeah, we, we have we have to, uh, so uh, and just alluding to what Chris was talking about, the Hop Research Council, the HRC, uh, we're a member, we're a paying member. Uh, I'm one of the people that uh, actually, I, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm an active member of the HRC and kind of work with the uh, the budgeting committee. And uh, guess what? Uh, farmers up in Yakima Valley, up in Willamette Valley, up in the Pacific Northwest are trying to figure out what the next new hop is. And being an R&D brewery, we're the perfect size for them to sit, s- send down a lot of different hops that are not commercialized and allow us to play around with them and and then we give them back feedback and it, we we have a very sophisticated lab uh at our main production facility and we can do sensory analysis we can also do statistical analysis we can uh run it through uh very sophisticated uh uh equipment and send all that information back to the farmers so that they can then make these decisions decisions on what to grow uh, hmm. for next season and for maybe the next decade. And we are, we're honored to be able to actually do that. So that's really cool. And I, I guess I should throw out also that uh, uh, our, our beers that we brew, even though it's very small scale, we do send them out to every location in California. So Long Beach, right. at Disney, at Miramar, Linda Vista and Little Italy. If 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 you want to taste the beers that we're talking about, all these innovative ideas and these R and D beers, uh, if you live in California, uh, you can try them. And uh, we love feedback, so I I always love hearing what people think of those beers, and we're we're always going to try to think of ways to to innovate uh, in regards to getting customer feedback as well, uh, because. Uh, it's it's a constant process of improvement. No beer is perfect. You always have to think about, well, uh, what if we did this? What if we did that? How would that improve that beer? So that's kind of where we're at. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's great to be able to play with different raw materials because on a large scale, uh, it can have big impl- implications. Uh, one right. thing that we love doing is pulling in base malt. And when I say that, that's that's the malt that we use the majority of in a recipe. Uh, we've pulled it in from pallets all around the world. We've used Admiral Malting here in, in, in California. Shout out to Ron Silverstein. I love Ron. And, uh, you know, uh, we, we pulled malt from everywhere. We have a pallet from, from Belgium. Uh, that we're going to brew with, and we we formulate our ideas, uh, and and have this opinion so that we eventually, even though we are doing everything on a small scale, we can eventually go to a large scale, and it, it can really help out a lot. So, uh, yes, it it is very creative and it's a free for all, but it's also uh, it still has to help out the company as well. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, right? Everyone's <laughs> going like, man, you guys are spoiled and stuff, but it, 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 that's that's part of the that's that's part of the process, kind of seeing what's going to be all fun and games, and what's going to be let's say quote unquote scalable, which, which means it, can this beer with this wacky idea can it can it scale? And that's that's a loaded question, right? Because just because something uh, is scalable doesn't mean that it's it's cost efficient. It means this is great enough to release into the world for consumers to try all around, you know, the state, all around the country, all around the world. And it's one of those things that you have to ask yourself, okay, this particular beer, we're brewing it to be consumed to tomorrow. This is not going to age well and, and we're going to learn a lot from it, but it's fun and it's for everybody that's going to be here. This particular beer is something that we're thinking about the long term and we're going to want to uh, at some point scale it because you know, it's something that doesn't exist. It should, or it's a great, it's a great flavor. We all agreed. And that's one of the beauties of having like Aaron, you were talking about all our, all our tasting rooms all throughout California. It's like a real time consumer feedback loop, you know, in the time of COVID it's kind of, it's been stifled, but, um, but well, that's the COVID actually is, is it, that's an interesting point. COVID has proven that people uh, are liking me included higher alcohol beer Ooh. i've seen that trend <laughs> uh if i'm taking beer home i want it to be a, at least seven abv you know <laughs> yeah yeah and uh and and you know uh, bart watson did a, a study on this with the brews association he's seeing this now starting to split where it's either low alcohol or high alcohol and the in between is just really not that popular anymore. So what's low alcohol? What's the low alcohol metric? Like four, and what, what, four, four ABV. And, four ABV. Uh, and then what's the know, high? And, and then the seven and eights. Uh, we, we, we made this uh, hazy IPA spelt bound, which uh, uses spelt malt, which is a kind of a variant of, 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 of wheat malt. Um, and people love it and it's selling really well. And guess what? The alcohol content's pretty high. So it's, it's hoppy and it's high alcohol. So, you know, and we have to roll with this. And so you're saying uh, you bring up a, a, a good point about having this feedback. And we see this and we see kegs kicking very quickly. And it goes back to also stuff that we like drinking. And it's like, huh, higher alcohol. OK, here we go. But, you know, that's just for COVID. What happens when COVID's gone? Right. And uh, everyone's vaccinated and, and the world's back to nor normal. Uh, you know, in, in a year, uh, what's going to be the trend? Well, I guess we'll have to just, just, we'll just have to figure it out. Right. And that's the beauty of it, though. The beauty of it is that there is an ebb and flow. There is this kind of up and down thing. And, and, and a lot of beer consumers, especially of, you know, big domestic brands, they think that one beer should be cemented and it should always be around and there should be no alterations and just keep it the way I like it. But in craft beer, what you guys are doing, what we're all doing collectively is saying we can brew for the times. We will brew for this. And we will brew for Everybody wants uh, sours this year all right let's give them a sour a well-constructed well-thought-out sours sour and then does you want high bb you want sessionable poundable like crushable stuff and that's what you guys are coming up with down in little italy so it's been really amazing to see what the three of you have been able to to produce uh in your little play place down there it's 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 great and i know a lot of brewers listening are jealous but it is it it, it is kind of the winning uh setup i'm curious comes... though what the, the the two chris's think are the next beers uh i already Ooh. said mine uh obviously hoppy high alcohol uh some finding something interesting in, in that realm is is uh yeah it's tried and true but i see that at least for the next year but uh, guys go ahead yeah yeah i'm interested too <laughs> uh, maybe high alcohol lagers <laughs> I can see that too. High alcohol lagers. Yep. Crisp, refreshing, dry, and high alcohol. I can see that. What about what about you, Chris T? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. I think there's a I think there's a, a space um, in the market for a, kind of a, a higher octane 
pale, simple lager that's just well made. Um, and I, you know, in San Diego, I mean, and maybe this is just my my own personal bias because it's what I end up with in my fridge all the time. I have I have Swamis from Pizza Port in my fridge, kind of all the time. Um, and from what, from what I was was drinking earlier, that's been on for a while now. Uh, I, I love West Coast IPAs. I I still think again because. You know, uh, Pizza Port I think has established a really cool thing where they have kind of the same grain bill. You have a you have something that you know how to handle that gives you reproducible results that taste really good, and you kind of riff the hops on top of it. Um, and when you have access to these new hops coming out, uh, you know you get into a you get into a play. I mean, society with the Bachelor, like there's there's a there's a uh, I will always buy Pizza Port's variants, right? Uh, because they get good hops. They know how to use them. Um, just, I guess I'm pitching pizza port now. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, that's what I drink. It's not that's a bad thing. I, yeah. my fridge. I like really dry, crisp, not overly bitter, but nicely bitter IPAs. Um, and I still think that there is wiggle room in that space, even though, you know, every, every brewery in San Diego has their version of it. Um, I, I think that there's, again, because our raw materials are constantly changing, uh, there's room for new, new versions of styles that we're all really familiar with. Um, and I think when, you know, a lot of, a lot of consumers, um, I mean, I'm not, I'm not into market analysis really. So I take this with a grain of salt, but I think like, you know, people, people maybe like the there's a little bit less brand loyalty now when people are at a, at a store and there's so much variation and they, they're buying new stuff all the time. But at the same time, you kind of come back to the same breweries a lot because you right. know making yeah. something that you like so you can trust them to make something else that you like. Um, and so, you know, you kind of tend to buy styles that you know you're going to enjoy from breweries that you're going to enjoy. Um, right. So, I, I, yeah, like I said, I, I think there's, there's still – plenty of room in the, in the West coast IPA category. And maybe that's just, maybe that sounds lame, but, um, for my palate, uh, I will always buy a new IPA from the brewery that I trust to make it. And right. It's I kind of like brand it. loyalty, brand loyalty versus brand security, right? Like <laughs> brand loyalty. I'm just buying anything that these guys produce, whether it's good or bad. And then brand security is like, I'm venturing out. And I know that if I buy from these guys, I will at least get a uh, a good representation from my palate uh, of this particular one off style or whatever that they're that they're brewing. And I don't want to get too far out. Sorry, uh, Chris. Get far out, man. Chris H. We'll we'll, we'll go to you because I saw you about to talk. But uh, uh, just real quick, uh, you know, I will say that West Coast IPA was was evolving uh, before Hazy's came onto the scene. Once Hazy's uh, came onto the scene. Uh, West Coast kind of got shoved to the side, but it was this uh, West Coast IPAs were really bitter and then they started becoming less bitter and started using less uh, specialty malts. So they became less sweet, less bitter, but still super dry. And, and these were exciting IPAs. And then Hazy's came, on, uh, came along and they were using some of the similar flavor profiles, uh, but it was more aesthetics. So I, I, I could easily see it going back to West Coast IPA, but a different type of West Coast IPA that's less bitter, super dry. Mm -hmm. And what we're playing around with, and I don't want to give away too much because uh, we're still playing around with it. And, uh, give us a teaser. Some give us a teaser, Aaron. We're, we're going to really focus on water profile uh, because that's the last thing that we're really delving into. And we've kind of come up with the ideal water profile for the West Coast IPA. So I, I could see us uh, releasing some variant of what we're making right now uh, commercially within a year. And I'll just leave it at that. It's <laughs> <laughs> a good teaser, man. It's a good trailer. Chris Hotz, were you going to say something, brother? Uh, I was just going to say the cool the cool thing about beer is is you're using these ingredients malt, uh, barley in essence hops, uh, yeast and and especially with hops and barley you know those are those are grown annually and, and they change with the season especially hops uh, and and so the cool thing about hoppy beers and IPA is, is they're constantly changing right I, that's true you know we started off with with me drinking this. 
this beer here, uh, you know, it's, mosaic, it's a mosaic IPA or pale ale, I should say. And it is the fruitiest mosaic beer that I've ever had, I would say. And, you know, it's, what did they do different? I mean, the mosaic can come from a different acreage, different climate, uh, different part of the country. And, yeah. Uh, so the cool thing about especially is, is uh, it changes all the time. So no two hop beers are going to be the same because no two mosaics. Are the same. That's good. That's a good point. <clears throat> People talk about it all the time in wine, and not necessarily too much in beer, but the terroir of of your raw material, uh, especially of a of an impactful, you know, really intense raw material like a like a hop. Um, you know, you're going to pick, you are able to pick up the subtleties and the differences between crop to crop, even if it's the same hop, the crop year, and you got to be looking for it. And the people that are looking for it, like you guys are looking for it, are able to, to, to take some of these flavor profiles or characteristics and, and play with them in a very different way than someone that's just kind of brushing over, maybe reading what they're supposed to be as opposed to really going in there and doing a sensory profile of it. Um, and, and then you guys make a beer and you adjust from there. And that's the whole point of the art. And, you know, I, I keep going back to this word art because I think that we all, as far as ballast points concerned, we all get, you know, the art of our, of, 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 of our labels. And we've done a really good job of, of focusing on, on the art of of our look and our brand and our aesthetic and man it's such a great aesthetic but a lot of people can't get wrap their heads around how um something like brewing beer is an art as opposed to a hobby a lot of people call it a hobby but it's not a hobby it's it it, it is a hobby but it also it encompasses this uh level of intricate detail that unless you're really willing to go that deep into it um, can be something super artistic. And the way that you guys are painting on the canvas with your different colors down at Little Italy is a testament to that. Thank you. Okay, well, that's it. Yeah, that's it. I, I'm, 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 I'm off your ear or anything. I had muted myself. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the dreaded echo, the, the, the Zoom echo. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> You know, Tommy Arthur at a um, Tommy Arthur of Lost Abbey gave a good speech about the, the the artistry of brewing, and I was always a little bit of a critic about. I always said I'm not an artist. I'm I'm an artisan or right. craftsperson, uh, where it's more of like photography, where you you take this piece of equipment and you make something with it that people want but that they find desirable. And that, that's kind of always what I looked at with brewing was not necessarily that this is uh, art per se, that it's going to make people think about society as a whole, you know, and to, <laughs> to make a statement. Uh, but nonetheless, we are going to be criticized by our, our consumers, our beer drinkers, our friends, and then we we adjust our 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 the way that we make the beer so that we can uh, make people enjoy it better. It, it is like it, it's a very intimate relationship between us and the people that drink the beer, and it's really it's 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 a unique situation. And in that way, uh, I would agree with Tommy Arthur that it is that expression is we tried this, what do you think? Right. And whatever they think uh, is unique, obviously, to, to from person to person, but it, it is still something that uh, resonates and it's undeniable, it's 100%. powerful. So in that way, that, that is an expression of, of us and what we're trying to accomplish. So uh, yes, there is, I, I will agree, <laughs> Even though I disagreed, I agree that there's a, a, an element of art in what we do. Well, and I well, leave it at that. I, no, that's beautiful. That that's actually absolutely beautiful. The, one of the ways that I've looked at it in the past, and I think I've talked to you guys about this too. It's like 
I, all that we're doing here is flavoring people's lives, whether it's someone that wants to enjoy their occasion, whether it's a groomsman or bridesmaid that wants to make this moment memorable and the bride or the groom happens to like beer, they're going to make a decision. They're going to go to their store, their local bottle shop, whatever, local brewery, and they're going to make a decision about what am I going to choose to flavor my life with at this particular moment? What am I going to hopefully stamp into, you know, the final role when it when when you kind of take a step back and you look at your life and you kind of start cutting through um, final cut? What's a part of that? And what did what embellished it? And all I hope for, and it's very much because of you guys down a little Italy that this even begins to be a thing. All I hope for is that as a company, as a brewery, we're producing um, a, a product that is is worthy of embellishing people's lives, their moments, and 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 really going that was awesome, or this is going to be awesome. Let's take it up a notch and get a six pack of Ballast Point beer or or whatever. So. Um, that's what you guys are doing. Inspire and be inspired, right? It goes back Ooh. to what we started with, right? Uh, you know, be inspired. We like to drink other people's beer, be inspired. And hopefully, uh, hopefully maybe we inspire a couple other breweries as well. It's collaborative. We're a community. This might be a good time to cheers. Uh, do I have, give me 30 seconds. Go, go ahead. Get out of here. Go quick. I mean, that's always a good thing. When somebody runs out of beer on the show, I'm just like, hell yeah. <laughs> so with that said, man, look, listen, <clears throat> in a barley husk, this is what we're doing here at Ballast Point. We have three seasoned pros um, with a varying palate that are responsible for getting us past the first step, which is the creation. And I, I, I gotta say, man, I, I, I don't feel, I, I can't say that I, I, I'm in, 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 this is such a beautiful thing to be able to talk to you guys because I feel like we're in good hands as a company. That's what I meant to say. You guys have a kind of system set up down at Little Italy that is able to produce just magic upon magic. The proof is in the pudding. So with that, thanks for jumping on the show. I'm glad that you guys were able to express yourselves and tell your story. And I hope that everybody benefits, home brewer, uh, pro brewer, just connoisseur alike. Um, just drink more beer. Amen Cheers. to that. Can do that. <laughs> Salud, Cheers. caballeros. <laughs> mm. All right, guys. That was amazing. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Um, be sure to like, subscribe, and share the rest of our episodes on uh, Ballast Point's YouTube page, channel, whatever. Uh, you can follow us on ballastpoint.com, Instagram, Facebook, all that jam. I'll see you next time, and thanks for tuning in.